Here's today's first word, daily devotion. We have made it all the way to November the 25th, Ezekiel 32 through 33. 32 verse 1, in the 12th year, in the 12th month, on the first day of the month, the word of the Lord came to me, son of man, raise a lamentation over Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and say to him. Now flip the page just for time's sake. Look at what he says. And then the reason for him saying what he says is captured for us at the end of verse 15. And you won't be surprised at this. Here's the reason. Then they will know that I am the Lord. This is a lamentation that shall be chanted. The daughters of the nations shall chant it over Egypt and over all her multitude shall they chant it, declares the Lord God. Now let's look at chapter 33 then. Look at chapter 33. But if he had taken warning, he would have saved his life. But if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet so that the people are not warned and the sword comes and takes any one of them, that person is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood I will require of the watchman's hand. So there is this obligation that we have, those of us who know the truth, to be um, uh, to clar- uh, to call the truth with clarity, and to ensure that we are sounding the truth, so that people will not disregard but heed the warning. So our place as those who have received truth is to do our diligence to get the truth to as many people as possible, as quickly as possible, as clearly as possible. Verse 10 then, And you, son of man, say to the house of Israel, Thus have you said, Surely our transgression and our sins are upon us, and we run away because of them. How then can we live? Say to them, As I live, declares the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn back, turn back from all your evil ways. For why will you die, O house of Israel? And there's this important principle for us to consider as we think through how to tell truth and what to tell. We have this, God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. But his pleasure comes when that wicked person turns from his wicked ways and again chooses life. Verse 17 then really helps us to see the problem. The problem is, is that these people have forgotten the Lord. Yet your people say the way of the Lord is not just when it is their own way that is not just. When the righteous turns from his righteousness and does injustice, he shall die for it. When the wicked turns from his wickedness and does what is just and right, he shall live by this. What great principles are coming to us here from the Lord. At verse 23 then, the word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, the inhabitants of these waste places in the land of Israel keep saying, Abraham was only one man, yet he got possession of the land. But we are many, the land is surely given to us to possess. Therefore say to them, Thus saith the Lord God, You eat flesh. You eat flesh with the blood, and lift up your eyes to your idols and shed blood. Shall you then possess the land? In other words, the people have a wicked heart that needs to be uh, dealt with. Verse verse 30, Come and hear what the word of the Lord. Uh, Come and hear what the word is that comes from the Lord. And they come to you as people come, and they sit before you as my people. They hear what you say, but they'll not do it. For with lustful talk in their mouths they act. Their heart is set on their gain. Behold, you are to them like one who sings lustful songs with a beautiful voice and plays well on an instrument, for they hear what you say, but they won't do it. When this comes, and come it will, then they will know that a prophet has been amongst them. So what do they need? They don't need a better speaker. They don't need a better preacher. They don't need a better message. They need a new heart that is ready to hear a new heart that is ready to obey. And of course, this is a very sobering passage for any preacher. Far be it from us to desire a crowd, as much as every preacher loves a crowd, more important than a crowd is a changed life. More important than filling up notes on a notepad is a walking out with a full heart that's ready to obey God's word. And so let's look at 2 Peter then, 
Peter has a reminder. He's asking us to recall something, which, by the way, is the reason why we take up this first word daily devotion, the reason we're reading the Bible and going through this exercise here this late in the year because we want these things to be brought to our mind. He says, I intend always to remind you of these qualities, though you already know them and are established in the truth that I have. But he says, as long as I'm in the body, I'm going to remind you. And then in verse 16, for we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We were eyewitnesses of his majesty. And this is a, such an important passage. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory. This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves, we ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. And we, listen to what he says, we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Now, what's he talking about there? He's talking about, before we jump ahead, listen, get the context. Peter is saying we were with him. We heard the voice on the mountain. Not only did we see him with our eyes, we had the voice ensure that our eyes were, in, uh, our eyes were rightly interpreting reality. Remember, with our eyes we see, but with our ears we interpret. And so Peter's saying we had both things. We had eyesight as well as hearing. And then Peter says, but you are in a better position than we were on that day. And then Peter, of course, lumps himself in with the rest of us. He said, we have the prophetic word more sure or fully confirmed. And then he says, pay attention to this word. It's a word coming as a shining light in a dark place. And what's he talking about? What word do we have? Well, look at verse 20. Knowing this, first of all, no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. No prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Now, that's a anchor passage for what we call the doctrine of inspiration. That is, we believe the Bible is the inspired, inerrant, and infallible, authoritative Word of God. And listen to what that means. It means that we have something better than Jesus standing right in front of us. We have something better because we have Holy Scripture. Matter of factly, we should say this to round off what I mean. If we didn't have scripture, though Jesus were right in front of us, we would not recognize him. But since we have scripture, we can look to the pages of scripture from our vantage point of faith now, and then we will be able to recognize Jesus. Because Jesus, of course, confirms his whole life, or conforms his whole life according to scripture, and scripture confirms the life of Jesus Christ. We have the prophetic word more sure. Now pay attention, pay attention to scripture, which is by the way, let me encourage you, that's exactly what we've been doing as we've been reading the Bible. We've been paying attention to holy scripture. Psalm 119 then, let's go back to our Hebrew lesson as we close today. Aleph, Beit, Gimel, Dalet, He, Vav, Zion, Chet, Tate, Yod, Chaf, Lamed, Mame, Nun, Samek, Ayan, He. And today, what is this word here? Well, it's Sade. Sade. And look at verse 144. Your testimonies are righteous forever. Give me understanding that I may live.